time you really all have to go silent after all. Anyhow, good morning. Welcome to Policy Exchange. My name's uh, Dean Godson. I have the pleasure of being uh, your host today. We like to be at uh, the heart of national conversation on key issues, and uh, one most important is being addressed here uh, today with the inaugural address uh, as chair of the Social Mobility Commission uh, by Kathleen Burble Singh, known to uh, many of you as uh, perhaps the most uh, successful uh, school head in the country, but now with a wider uh, national canvas and delighted to be able to welcome her here today for this, also to extend a warm uh, welcome to Deputy Chair of Social Mobility Commission, Alan Francis, uh, Principal of uh, Chief Executive of Oldham uh, College and uh, author of this uh, remarkable uh, policy exchange paper published late last year, Rethinking Social Mobility for the Leveling Up Era, which I commend to all of you in case anyone here shouldn't have uh, read it already. Um, Catherine will deliver her address for 20 minutes. Um, we'll then throw it open to the floor uh, for questions. Uh, she and uh, Alan will come onto the platform. Uh, usual uh, house rule, of course, uh, no question too outrageous. You just have to state your name and organization first. So Catherine, thank you for coming here today and very much looking forward to hearing what we have to say. Hello, everyone. It's so great that you've taken time out of your days to come and see us, Alan and I. Alan is my deputy chair, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions later. Um, and yes, thanks for coming. So, um, it's a great privilege, and we want to chart a new course for the Commission as it reports on the state of social mobility in this country. We are very aware that this is a difficult time to be taking over, We've had a pandemic, followed by a European war and a cost of living crisis. And there were already many challenges uh, to deal with before, and it'll be even harder now. This makes it all the more important that we try to approach the challenge of improving social mobility with clarity, and that we make recommendations that are going to make a difference. We want to bring a fresh approach and some new questions, like, uh, what can we do for those young people and adults who are not followed who have not followed the higher education pathway, but still need a route to high skills and good occupational opportunities? And what more should be done about those at the very bottom, particularly those with low levels of basic literacy and numeracy, who cannot take advantage of higher learning and are unable to access higher paid work? And what to do about the geographical aspects of all this, both in terms of local neighborhoods where, for a whole variety of reasons, educational and economic outcomes and opportunities appear to be poor across generations. We want to move away from the notion that social mobility should just be about the long upward mobility from the bottom to the top, i.e. the person who was born into a family, say in uh, social housing, and then becomes an accountant or a banker or a big CEO. There's nothing wrong with that view of social mobility, but it's not enough. We want to promote a broader view of social mobility for a wider range of people who want to improve their lives, sometimes in smaller steps. So this means looking at how to improve opportunities for those at the bottom, not just making elite pathways for a few, but by thinking about those who would otherwise be left behind, those who either didn't want to or could not leave to achieve. This means thinking differently and collecting and using data differently. It means being clearer about where mobility is working well and being clearer about the various factors which help to make this happen. It also means being clearer about obstacles which hold people back and how they can be overcome. Today, I'd like to introduce you to some of the thinking that will inform this fresh approach. We're going to move away from the popular narrative about social mobility, which we refer to as the Dick Whittington model. In this model, the focus is on big leap upward mobility, from the bottom to the top in one generation, breaking from the circumstances you were born into to achieve in various combinations fame, fortune, and occupational status. For the folklore version of Dick Whittington, there was a definite leveling up aspect to his mobility. He grew up in Lancashire, but had to leave for London to make his dreams come true. If he was born in Lancashire today, 
His route to an elite profession might still take him along the same geographical route from the north to London, but instead of a picnic and a cat, he would now need to take with him some brilliant educational credentials and then find his way through the door of an elite professional company to make his way in life. Much social mobility work has been dominated by trying to make this Dick Whittington model fairer. Attention is then focused on how to make sure opportunities are shared equally. This is usually done by identifying the gaps in opportunity between the disadvantaged and everyone else. Where disparities or gaps can be found between these two groups, they are presented as evidence of inequalities of opportunity, and it is recommended that policy should focus on closing the gaps so that the opportunities in managerial and professional jobs for both groups are more equal. Frequently, but not always, this approach is accompanied by the view that social mobility is in decline. This is usually inferred from data relating to inequality. If inequality is increasing, or simply not decreasing, the argument goes, then opportunity is not fair, so social mobility will be in decline. You may be familiar with the metaphor of the ladder. The ladder represents opportunity for upward mobility, stepping from one rung to another. But if the rungs are further apart because of growing inequality, where the richest person is further and further away from the poorest person, then the challenge of moving from one rung to the other is harder. This often leads to a fairly pessimistic and dismal set of conclusions about the capacity of people to overcome the circumstances into which they were born. There is no consensus about what measures work well and quite a lot of confusion about what we are actually measuring. Most of the time, policy debates appear to be talking about social mobility, but are using evidence which is about inequality. Inequality is clearly an important theme in social mobility, and inequality does shape and affect opportunity. But inequality and social mobility are not the same thing, and we should be careful not to conflate them. We could reduce inequality, for example, without improving social mobility. We could just reduce the gap between the top and the bottom without improving the movement in between. Similarly, we could improve social mobility without reducing inequality by moving a higher percentage of people from the bottom to the top, but allowing the gap between the two to increase. We need to collect the evidence and look at it carefully before we come to any conclusions. If we don't, we can quickly end up in a very dismal place with a slightly caricatured binary view of society divided into two groups. A group at the bottom, which has very little chance of improving their situation because it cannot overcome the inequality which separates it from everyone else, no matter what measures may be put in place to support their social mobility. And then there's another group which includes everyone who's not in the bottom group, whose achievements and accomplishments are not attributed to their efforts, but are a byproduct of their relative levels of privilege. Neither group has any agency. Everyone is quite literally a prisoner of the circumstances into which they were born. Are things really this bad? <laughs> is it really so impossible for people to su succeed despite their circumstances, no matter what interventions and support we provide? What's actually going on? Despite the popular narrative, it's not true that social mobility is getting worse on all counts. In reality, the picture is more complex. On some measures, it is doing better than others, and on some, such as occupational mobility, it has been fairly stable for decades. There have been big changes in the economy as the service industry has grown. In the latter part of the 20th century, the occupational structure shifted considerably, creating more white collar than blue collar jobs. So more people were able to move up the occupational hierarchy compared to their parents. But more recently, while we are still generating professional and managerial jobs, the rate has slowed. There are fewer people born into families who have routine and manual occupations and more born into families with professional and managerial jobs. There is competition from those wishing to move up at the same time as people being at risk of moving down. This is often referred to as the problem of less room at the top. 
which makes it look like social mobility is worsening when it might not be. Of course, occupational mobility is only one aspect. There, are, there is less consensus about mobility in income and in other things like housing or wealth. But given this evidence, we need to stop presenting social mobility in this way. For some people, it feeds the view that the country is less open to talent than it has been in the past. There are clearly areas where we need to improve, but there are also areas where we're doing really well. As usual, the truth is more complex. Those born nearer to the top have advantages over those born nearer to the bottom. But we need to be careful about moving from this general observation to the conclusion that no one has any agency or that the gaps and disparities between the disadvantaged and everyone else are set in stone. We need a more analytical approach if we want to understand what is going on. Some of the evidence for this will be presented in the State of the Nation report for 2022, which the Commission team is currently working on. This is our annual report to Parliament on the overall picture of social mobility. A big concern in the report is the need for clearer definitions and measurements of social mobility. And for the first time, we will be including the best scientific measures of actual social mobility outcomes, looking at the same person's starting and ending point. We will also be revisiting the conditions that help to hinder social mobility and tracking outcomes in early adulthood. The aim is to present a more nuanced picture from which we can be more focused in our analysis and understanding of what works well and what does not. What we can say at this point is that the picture is more encouraging than people have come to expect. There are some significant improvements and very often, often a narrowing of gaps between disadvantaged groups and everyone else. This is important because structural issues do shape opportunities, but as I've said, we should be consider, considering a wider range of explanations, not just inequality alone. This is because human beings, well, may, may be born into the circumstances not of their own choosing, but they also retain agency. So it is important to pay attention to some of the issues that social mobility policy is not always comfortable talking about. For example, diversity of talent. This is often referred to in passing, but rarely analyzed in detail. And when it is mentioned, the focus is nearly always on cognitive ability. This is hugely important, but other forms of talent and ability can be ignored, perhaps because society tends to mainly respect the type of cognitive ability that will secure a lucrative professional job. Instead, we believe that other talents and other jobs should be valued too. Families are frequently mentioned in terms of social mobility, but mainly as vehicles for passing on privilege. It is widely acknowledged by experts in the field that in terms of shaping opportunity for children, families play a bigger role than any other institution. We are keen to spend more time talking about families and parenting and the central role these have in shaping outcomes culture and values on a broader level also need to feature more strongly. These are sometimes acknowledged, but are probably not given sufficient weight in terms of their positive and negative implications for social mobility. I addressed issues of culture in the recent documentary about our school, Michaela, when we should not underestimate the impact of culture and values. It is also important to think in a more nuanced way about the distribution of opportunity. Part of the problem may be to do with definitions and data. And we live in a world where we can get some data, and that's a good thing, and we have, but we have to be thoughtful about how we use and interpret it. Take, for example, the way we think about occupational mobility. In the usual model that the government uses for classifying occupations, there are eight categories. These are often collapsed just into three of categories. But the number of categories we use does a lot to determine whether we think social mobility is high or low. The more categories we have, the more movement we will find. The fewer categories we have, the more we lose focus on the shorter mobilities between them. When it comes to looking at inequality, things can be equally simplistic. 
Much of the research drops into a model which separates the disadvantaged on one side and everyone else on the other. The definitions of disadvantage may differ depending on whether occupation, income, free school meals, or the index of multiple de deprivation are used. Furthermore, they obscure differences between people in the same category as well as people who move between categories and don't rigidly fit into either. There is a huge amount of research into the dynamics of poverty, who moves in and out temporarily, who gets stuck, and what circumstances shape this. So we should not treat the disadvantaged as all being the same. Similarly, there is a problem with the way everyone else is grouped together. Any model which places the state educated children of one parent police officers or primary school teachers or local government officers from Hartlepool into the same category as the elite public school educated children of rock stars from Notting Hill and CEOs of the FTSE top 100 companies and labels them all as non-disadvantaged is probably not telling us as much as we need to know. This, however, is exactly what quite a lot of social, show social mobility research does. It reduces social mobility to a contest between these two groups. This then stops us from thinking about social mobility for everyone. It can end up improving the condition of a small number without changing the opportunities for everyone else. We need to recognize that social mobility has many forms, and one size does not fit all. Consider this. If a child of parents who were long-term unemployed or who never worked gets a job in their local area, isn't that a success worth celebrating? Would we really want to say that it doesn't count as mobility simply because they're not an accountant or a lawyer? I mean, do we all want to be lawyers? I hope there's no lawyers in the room. I don't want to be a lawyer. Surely not. Yet much analysis of social mobility wouldn't even notice that it had happened. We need to know a lot more about what people think about social mobility. Research of this kind will challenge us all to think about the wider range of factors which influence ambition and aspiration. We want to think about the opportunities we create for those who will not access the elite pathway, who this model often leaves behind. We have, over the last generation, had too much focus on a one-size-fits-all model for social mobility, which tends to consider higher education expansion as the key means of improving opportunity. While many have benefited from this, and it's good, it is time to consider those who have not. And this brings me back to the questions I posed at the start. What to do for young people and adults who have not followed the higher education pathway but still need a route to high skills and good occupational opportunities? What more should be done about those at the very bottom, particularly those with low levels of basic literacy and numeracy? What to do about the geographical aspects of this, local opportunities and outcomes? All of these issues and themes directly link to the challenge of leveling up. In the Dick Whittington view, the best option is to promote a leave to achieve approach. But the unforeseen consequence of this is to make things worse for the people and places they are leaving behind. Social mobility policy needs to mean something for those people and those places. And for us, the link between social mobility policy and leveling up missions and targets in the government's white paper is critical. They, they are not identical, but the overlap is considerable. The whole point of leveling up should be to create more opportunity for more people in more places. And a refocused social mobility policy can be a powerful tool for both directing these efforts, measuring them, and holding stakeholders to account for delivering them. So where does this leave us? We will be focusing on three interconnected themes. Education which includes early years, schools, universities, but also other routes, such as further education and apprenticeships. And as we have said, we will be keen to understand more about how we can help families and parents. Employment. A lot will focus on employers, but not just large professional firms. 
we also want to look at the role of smaller enterprises in generating opportunity and at how the value of qualifications, particularly degrees and technical qualifications, is shaped by wider issues in the labor market, including levels of regulation. Enterprise and the economy. We are interested in the creation of opportunities, their geographical spread, the role of enterprise in sometimes consolidating and sometimes disrupting traditional social mobility hierarchies. In the era of leveling up, these themes need to have much more attention because they are central to ensuring better opportunities are available. But we will also be prepared to look at these differently to try and capture the wider range of factors which help or hinder opportunity. We want to look at a wider range of social mobility journeys so that policy is not solely focused on the success of a small number. We want to develop a strong evidence base of what works and an equally sharp focus on obstacles to opportunity. In conclusion, we want to champion a fresh approach which sees social mobility as the process of enabling everyone to find and apply their talents in ways that they enjoy and gives them purpose, and for our wider society and economy. This does not mean we reject all of the work that has already been done, but it means going further. It will require us to start thinking differently about how we define social mobility, measure it, and assess it, and about what really works if we want to make more opportunities for more people in more places. It's going to be a big but exciting challenge. Thank you. Thank you for the address. I assume, I hope certainly, uh, many questions from the floor. I just want to see who's uh, first question up there. Gentleman there, if you just uh, would give you the microphone, name and organization, please. Thanks very much, Dean. Um, it's Richard Taylor here. Um, really sort of welcome your um, uh, presentation. So thank you very much indeed for that. That's, that's fantastic. And really sort of uh, looking forward to the fresh approach. Um, in terms of obviously you needing to wait, wait for the evidence before you reach any conclusions and the recommendations as to, uh, as to what you think will, uh, will work. But just focusing on one of the areas that you mentioned, obviously education being one of them, that's only one of uh, your, uh, your, your areas of concern. Um, what has worked well in your experience as a teacher in terms of addressing some of the issues that you talked about? You talked about diversity of talent. Uh, you also talked about family and parenting, but also cultures and values and, and how you can shape that um, from the sort of the grassroots up. Yes, well, of course, Alan, also being a principal, we were just talking earlier about how uh, different this world is here <laughs> to the world that we've come from this morning in his college in Oldham and in my school in Wembley, and how um, people in this world don't necessarily understand um, uh, many of the children who, and young people and adults, in fact, that Alan works with, who, uh, you know, we imagine this idea that, oh, everyone needs to get to Oxbridge, everyone needs to be this top lawyer in the city. Um, but in fact, the reality is that we have a variety of children with a variety of different talents. <laughs> and, um, the, and some of them can misbehave. <laughs> and, and I would say, you know, people call me the strictest headmistress in Britain. In fact, if you type into Google who is the strictest headmistress in the world, you will find my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and people sort of make fun of this idea of strict. But as Alan was just telling me, um, the poor behavior of some students uh, can ruin their life's yeah. chances, you know? And people in this world don't realize how poor the behavior can be in some schools and, and in some classrooms. And if you're a child in one of those classrooms who's desperately trying to make something of yourself and get yourself to be socially mobile, if you can't hear the teacher's teaching, if everyone's disturbing you, it's, it's impossible. <laughs> so when it comes to improving schools, the number one thing that we need to do is get on top of the behavior. 
And I think we need to, you know, I wear that badge with pride for being the strictest headmistress. People imagine that I walk down the corridors with whips and chains, and, you know, but in fact, it's just about being clear with the children and understanding that children have agency. And I spoke about that in my speech, that adults also have agency, and that too often nowadays, we speak about all of us as if no one has any agency, and that if you're born into privilege, you will end up privileged, and if you're born in a disadvantaged group, therefore you're going to be disadvantaged forever. And we very much want to look at the people who buck the various trends the, 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 and celebrate them and think, well, what are those things that work? So one, being in a good school. Being in a good school, and when I say a good school, one where the behavior is good and where you've got good teaching going on. That makes a huge difference to a child. Um, other things that Alan and I have personally seen is families. So the families who are very committed to education who Alan was just saying to me this morning how uh, meetings happen, you know, an important meeting about deciding uh, a, a child's uh, GCSE choices or a child's, uh, whether they're going to do A levels, they're going to go off and do a B tech instead, or whatever it is. And parents, there are parents out there who don't show up. <laughs> and then there are other parents who come along with their little notebook and they're writing down and they want to find out everything they can and they're asking for advice. And so, I mean, we do, at, at Michaela, we do uh, gold parenting sessions, we call them. And, um, and we invite all the parents. And some parents come and some parents don't. And the ones that come hear my advice on what they should be doing at home with their child with regard to supporting with homework and what they can do on the weekends and so on. And of course, I mean, lo and behold, it's not a surprise. The parents who are showing up are often of the children who are maximizing their potential. Um, and that is a key point that we are talking about here, is this idea of maximizing people's potential. Um, and so that, that's just anecdotally from my experiences and Alan's experiences. Of course, as we move forward to uh, our report, in particular next year, we want to be able to analyze data on this and then bring forward uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an approach which is which just it moves away just from the anecdotal and, and, and brings more evidence, really, to kind of prove these points, to convince this world, your world. We need to convince you. Because Alan and I go around shouting all the time, don't you understand, don't you understand? And, um, and, and we're hoping that if we bring you some data, then maybe you'll be convinced. <laughs> Thank you. Alan, do you want to come in? Um, I, w I mean, I would say there's a mixture of things that have to do with uh, agency, behavior, culture. And then there's some things that people sometimes refer to as structural, which are about choices. So I would say absolutely families, um, the, the, the notion of working hard, you know, and that actually I think you find huge discrepancies in the education system between those who have understood what you need to do to do well in examinations, for example, and those who don't really kind of quite get that. We see that in FE, particularly around the research around English and maths. Every FE college in the country will have huge numbers of people resitting those at 16 or 17. <coughs> And they'll often arrive and tell you, I can't do maths. And of course they can. They just don't know how to go about it. They haven't been taught that or they haven't learned what you need to do to be successful. I'm not saying that everybody can get an A star in maths. That would be silly. But actually, the, most of us are in somewhere in the middle in terms of ability. And actually, with hard work, grit, determination and good guidance, you can do pretty well. And we see the benefits of that with some of those learners. So, but it's also about the choices they've got. So a wide variety of choices. So we're very supportive of the opening up of new technical routes, um, the, the shift towards more work-related options, and apprenticeships and so on. We want to look at the adult options of coming back and reskilling and upskilling and so on. Those choices are very important because if you, however hard you work, if you don't have the right range of choices, then you're not, you're gonna be pushed into a direction which doesn't get the right outcomes. And of course, there's some wider things there about the economy as well, uh, which are complex and difficult, but I think the kind of things that are embraced around the leveling up agenda, which is where the economy and those choices also kind of come to bear. So I suppose we'd say there's family and culture, there's the choices in terms of educational pathways, and then there's the wider set of economic issues which we want to kind of get underneath the skin of. Thank you. I see quite a lot of questions. Lady there in the aisle has a hand up. Yeah, that's you. Um, my name is Grace Osborne. I'm a social mobility advisor at PwC. Um, and I, I would like to know if you've got really any advice or will be looking to provide any advice for elite, elite institutions like mine 
um, as to how to provide authentic support for students who are unlikely to have our organisation as their final destination. When you say authentic support, you mean how do you get them to apply in the first place? Or do you mean once they've joined your organisation, how do you support them kind of not dropping out? No, so what I mean is for those who are very unlikely to end up at, as an accountant, how can we contribute to the wider social mobility mission in a way that feels authentic, but with the knowledge that actually they're, they're not going to be an accountant? Oh, I see. Oh, well, that's great that you want to. I mean, how brilliant. <laughs> um, how brilliant. Well, I mean, what I always say to people who, you know, if in, in wanting to change the narrative um, is talk about it. You know, talk about it uh, amongst your peers. Um, explain to them, look, notice how I was really surprised by what you said. I thought, wow, you're interested in that. Okay, great. I mean, because normally what happens is people who work... In, in, in your world are concerned, understandably, with your world. And it's great that you are. I mean, it's really good that um, uh, some of my pupils will have the opportunity to go and work for you one day, thanks to you broadening your, your vision about who, who would do well in your establishment. And, and that's a really great thing. Um, but it's important for all of you people in your world, to realize that that is a small percentage of my kids, a really small percentage. Um, and that when I'm thinking about the 95% or 90%, I've got to think, well, where are they going? What are they doing? And um, the more you talk about that with your colleagues, uh, the more the, the general narrative in the media and in, amongst everyone changes. And we recognize, because when we talk about the, those who are left behind, it's not just those who are left behind in Hartlepool. It, th those who are left behind in my school in London, those who are left behind all over because they're not seen, they're not valued. Um, th their professions that they end up in aren't valued. Uh, we look down on people who have a whole variety of different jobs out there and we just elevate this idea. I mean, who wants to be a banker anyway? I don't want to be a banker. And so, like, the fact is, and, and, and all these people, you know, you don't want to be. You're all doing a variety of jobs. Not everybody wants to be prime minister. You know, it was funny. This morning, a man ran into me in the street and he said, he said, oh, I heard you on the radio this morning. And I, went, I was talking a bit about what I've just said now and I said, I mean, not everyone wants to be Prime Minister. I mean, I don't want to be Prime Minister. Do you want to be Prime Minister? And he said, well, actually, I would rather <laughs> So I was not expecting that. <laughs> but I don't think most of us do. And so we need to, um, we just need to encourage us all to understand the idea of people fulfilling their talents, finding purpose in their lives, enjoying what they do. For one, we need a country with a variety of people doing a variety of things. If everyone became a lawyer, then we'd all be very angry people. But <laughs> secondly, we just, we want people, not everybody wants to be a lawyer. Everybody wants to do a variety of things. So just talking about it, I think. I mean, I don't know. Do you have other ideas? I do. Um, so I think, first of all, I think we've been surprised in the five or six months we've been doing the preparation for this with the amount of work that many employers are doing. So I think that's the first thing to say. That's, that's a really encouraging thing. Um, but um, there are three things I think, if, if you wanted my advice, this is my bit of advice. So um, number one is, I think, I think you're right to say, not just to focus on those who might end up working for you or with you. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, is that, um, partly based on geography, social background and so forth, some people grow up in an environment where they just don't know what the choices and options are. They never meet anybody who works in an, uh, a professional company. They, don't, they just don't know anybody that does that. So I just think the more you can introduce not only those people to your company, but your company to those people, that's a very good thing in itself. The second thing I would say is that I would encourage you not just to think about social mobility in terms of who you employ, but also who you, do you buy from. What does your, how is it built into your procurement strategy? Which small companies do you support? Um, there's a lot more than just about who becomes an accountant. And then my third point, which is more controversial, is I just wonder whether it's too hard to become an accountant and whether actually there's parts of the job that actually could be easier to do. And maybe that would make it a more open 
profession. I think that's true of law, and I think it's true of a lot of the professions. Um, and I would make this, this point, I think, if you look at the um, protections which you have in terms of becoming uh, uh, an elite professional, in terms of the, the, the value of that qualification, um, there's quite a lot of protection at the higher level. There's not a lot of protection for people at the lower level. So anybody can become a hairdresser in this country, which means, by the way, they can't just give you bad haircuts. They can't actually inject Botox into your face without any qualifications at all. Um, but it's very difficult to become a, an accountant. The exams are incredibly hard, harder than the degree, I would say, um, certainly harder than uh, A-levels. Um, I think they're, and they're done in a particularly challenging way. So that, that, those would be some of the areas that we would want to start having conversations with you. I know there's a, there's a very limited time now, I'm afraid. I'm just trying to see. I think that uh, I'll take uh, remaining questions, three of them in one. Gentleman there, I see online uh, Dame Patricia Hodgson, and gentleman there just in front of the lady who asked the last question. Do you want to ask the first one? Name an organisation, please. Thank you. Vivian Prince from the LSE. Catherine, it's a wonderful speech, and Alan, it's a marvellous paper, and I'm sure we're all here metaphorically waving flags as your ship goes down the slipway, and we wish you a prosperous voyage. My question is about a shoal that's right in front of you, and you describe it, Alan, as contentless education. Uh, when I was a charity commissioner, one of the things that astonished me was to discover how many, to carry on with the nautical analogy, how many of the educational charities sail too close to the wind of their charitable objects in trying to promote contentless education. And for all the reasons that you don't need to be told, it's an enormous block right at the very beginning, well before you get to any of the questions you were just discussing. I have a practical question for you, which is how far your remit can possibly go, and, and a suggestion. Are you going to be able to deal with this bit of what Michael Globe once, Globe once famously called the blob, and, and secondly, do you see any potential for something which once used to exist, uh, which was a very small, very elite, very um, powerful organization called Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Schools, which dealt with content full education and only that? Because it could be a huge ally to you if you could get it reconstructed in the form that it once used to exist in its prime. David Patricia Hodgson, UKRI, Deputy Chair of Trustees of Policy Exchange. David Patricia, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Lou you. A little louder, oh. please, just so the audience can hear you. Um, I'm a great admirer of everything that you've done. Um, can I just ask you about how we challenge the victimhood narrative? I sit on a number of public boards, and an enormous amount of time is spent on the EDI agenda but it's nearly always in terms of victimhood and having sessions in the office to support the victims and so on. And when I talk about recruitment, training and promotion, people look at me as though I'm mad. And that's not what it's about because it's actually about the jobs in HR, not really about social mobility. How do we tackle this? Thank you, just one last question there, gentlemen. Um, Jamie Ratcliffe, Network Homes. We're a housing association based in Wembley. Um, kind of, I'm hearing a lot about the theme of social mobility moving away from being a thing that's done to people, and I love the idea of agency. Something that seems to be missing, and maybe it's not, um, is around um, agency in place and taking some control and responsibility in your local community and environment. And that's something everybody can do, and I think it's really powerful and important, and wondered if it's part of your thinking. Thank you. Do you want to? Okay. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Um, shall I take your question then? Um, so, uh, yes, it is part of our thinking. Uh, we've, Catherine talked about the geographic aspect of this in particular, and that's not just the north south, red wall, southern thing, it's about every community. Um, and some of the questions that we want to get into around causality are very much about so, when we talk about family, it's not just the family in isolation, it's also community. Uh, why is it in some neighbourhoods? There is persistent underachievement. So things like you know opportunity areas have they been in, have they made a difference or have they not? If they haven't, then why not? You know we do need to understand those things. We've had a series of area-based interventions in education, but it's still not really clear what makes a significant difference in those areas. Um, so so the short answer to your question is yes, it is part of our thinking. But 
it's, it's in the range of things we want to kind of get underneath a little bit more in order to explore that and come to some conclusions. Catherine, final word. Well, yeah, two big questions there about victimhood. Of course, we're very much all about agency, which is exactly the opposite of the, the victimhood mantra. So uh, we want to change that narrative around victimhood and make it so that um, people understand and are inspired by those who buck the trends and through agency and are able to change their stars. And then in terms of um, you know, Austin and so on, I wouldn't place too much uh, hope on Ofsted. You, uh, you imagine that Ofsted marches in and kind of sorts schools out. I'm not sure that that necessarily happens, um, just because they, they visit schools every few years. So it's really about winning the hearts and minds of people, um, the win hearts and minds of people in education. And, uh, and, and that's already happening. I think there is a bit of a revolution happening in education, has been happening for the last 10 years. Um, and people are valuing uh, uh, better behaved classrooms. And as you say, the content that they're being taught is important. And there, there has been a real shift, I'd say, in the last 10 years. And, and, and there's more and more happening all the time. So there's reasons to be, to be positive. Good. Thank you. My apologies to anyone who may have been disappointed. This will not be our last uh, intervention in the area, <coughs> certainly. Um, I know we'll be hearing much more from uh, Catherine Verbal Singh and Adam Francis in uh, months, years to come. Uh, look forward to welcoming you back. Thank you for coming. And thank you, above all, to our guests of honor today. Thank you.